Hi, my name is David Kelsey, and today we're going to be talking about a particular type of fallacy in reasoning uh, called the ad hominem argument. And uh, ad hominems um, are essentially to confuse um, the direction or the aim um, of a response of an objection, right? So, for example, if I um, if I was debating someone on something and uh, they made an argument on a position and my response was not to attack the position or their argument, but instead them, right? Maybe something about them personally, right? That would be an ad hominem, right? It's to confuse the man uh, with the, the position, essentially, right? Okay. So a personal attack ad hominem is, like it sounds, it's an ad hominem that goes after uh, some particular uh, thing about the person, like maybe um, who they are um, as a person or what they've done, for example. So, uh, you know, the idea is that um, just because, say, someone is uh, a jerk or has a tattoo or talks a certain way or is a little different, it doesn't mean that what they say must be false, right? You have to um, evaluate and um, objectively check um, what a person says, not just for who they are, but, you know, essentially for how reasonable um, it is what they say, right? An inconsistency ad homina is like charging someone with hypocrisy. So, um, you know, um, it's essentially saying that, well, look, just because you changed your mind, you thought something different last week, so it means that what you say now must be wrong, must be false, you know? So, of course, um, we're all allowed to change our minds every once in a while, and if we do, it just doesn't, it doesn't mean immediately, or uh, doesn't mean for certain that what we say now, just because we've changed our mind, is in fact false, right? We could have a uh, good, good reason for thinking otherwise now, right? Uh, the next type of ad hominem is what we would call circumstantial. A circumstantial ad hominem is to attack uh, or criticize, uh, you know, someone's circumstances, like their history, or or uh, something of their past, for example. Imagine, uh, for example, you're going to, uh, you go to your local um, priest and, and you ask, you know, questions, philosophical questions, or say, say about, for example, something like abortion. And your priest, uh, he says to you, you know, he gives you this, this argument about uh, abortion and how you shouldn't do it and how it's wrong and all of that. Now, if you were to say just uh, offhand immediately to dismiss what the priest says as well, look, he's just got to say that he's a priest, right? That's part of his, his job, essentially who he is, right? That would be a, a circumstantial ad hominem, right? Just because of the fact that he's a priest and, and maybe he has to say that doesn't mean he doesn't have a good argument, right? So we have to um, think about the argument given, not the person making it. A positive ad hominem is, is kind of like, uh, you know, it's one of these ad hominems where it's not a, a negative, it's not a ridicule, it's not an objection to someone's argument just because of who they are. In fact, it's, it's actually sort of like buying into somebody's argument just because of who they are, right? So, for example, if we thought just because Einstein said something that it had to be true, that would be a kind of positive ad hominem, okay? Poisoning the well is kind of like an in advance ad hominem. I think uh, really the way to think about uh, poisoning the well is kind of like a rumor, spreading a rumor about someone. So when you spread a rumor about someone, you're sort of trying to poison uh, somebody else's mind about this, uh, you know, person that you're spreading the rumor about, you know. You're trying to damage that person's uh, reputation, for example, with this rumor, and so that's poisoning the well. And it's kind of like an in advance ad hominem because the person that you're poisoning, um, you know, the, the, the mind about isn't, isn't there to defend themselves, right? Um, so that's the idea with, with poisoning the well. Um, the next one is uh, what we would call genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy isn't actually an ad hominem, but it looks a lot like circumstantial ad hominem. So genetic fallacy is dismissing a claim because of the history or circumstances of the claim. Right? So if you remember back to circumstantial ad hominem, that's sort of like dismissing a claim because of the circumstances or history of its author. Right? That's circumstantial ad hominem. Here, Genetic fallacy is dismissing a claim because of the circumstances or history of the claim itself, 
right? So for example, if I was to say, well, look, I, I don't believe in God because when people started believing in God and they started talking about God, people uh, in that time, during that period of history, believed in, you know, magic and, and all sorts of, um, you know, sort of superstition and, and all of this. And so oh, it, can't, it just can't be true, right? Because of that, right? Well, of course, the history of a claim doesn't really um, really impact um, the truth or falsehood of the claim. You need to, you know, think about the reasons given now for su for such a claim, right? Okay, so the next set of um, fallacies we're going to look at is a straw man, false dilemma, and perfectionist fallacy. So straw man is <clears throat> is a type of argument that distorts. It's meant to distort or misrepresent an opponent's position, right? So um, the idea with the straw man is that if you're, say you're again sort of like debating someone and then they uh, give a kind of argument or take a position on something and then your response to that argument or position is essentially to twist it and to misrepresent it in such a way that it looks absurd, you know, that's to create the straw man. The straw man is kind of like the, you know, the, the weak representation of that argument. And then of course knocking the straw man down is is then taking that weak representation of the argument and then just uh, disputing it, right? Refuting it. Uh, so an example, a, a kind of simple example, if you think back to when you were a kid and your mom said, uh, you know, asked you like, hey, can you clean your room today? You know, um, you might say in response, oh, what, what do I have to clean my room out every day? You know, something like that. Uh, that would be a, a kind of straw man, right? So the idea is that, you know, of course your mom just wants you to clean your room out today and then you're making her it appear uh, in your response that she wants you to clean your room out every single day, right? When clearly that's not what she's asking. The next one is called a false dilemma. So a false dilemma is a dilemma, right? It's, it's a presentation of when somebody presents sort of like two options, but these aren't the only options, right? And there's usually like some sort of um, alternatives that are clearly, um, you know, good, available, preferred, possibly alternatives, you know? Um, so a really simple example is I say, um, you know, maybe I say to my, to my friend, you know, hey, uh, you guys wanna go out to the bar tonight? Uh, let's go to, either we can go to this place or we can go to the library, right? Either we can go to my favorite bar or we can go to, uh, you know, this, this library over here, right? Or we can go to the coffee shop or the, you know, the place I really wanna go to, the, the disco, you know? Something like that. So the idea is that um, you offer up when you uh, present a false dilemma, you're essentially offering up what you want and then something that's, you know, really not that good at all, you know. Uh, and so that's the false dilemma. And of course, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out what to do on a Friday night, it's not just, you know, sort of go to the club or the library, right? There's, uh, you know, you can go to the, to the restaurant, you can go to a party, you can go to all sorts of other places. And so that's the uh, nature of the false dilemma. Right? It neglects those on purpose, right? <clears throat> a perfectionist fallacy is a kind of false dilemma. And uh, the, the idea with perfectionist fallacy is it says essentially, well, it's got to either be perfect or we don't do it, right? And uh, the interesting thing about the perfectionist fallacy is it's often used when it really, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to use it, right? So, um, for example, somebody might say, well, look, I'm not going to quit smoking because quitting smoking, after all, isn't going to make me live forever, right? And, um, of course, the reason that you quit smoking isn't that you want to live forever. It's just that you want to live healthier, right? Then you want your life to be a bit better, and quitting smoking would do that. And so that seems to be the mistake with the perfectionist fallacy is that you're asking for, for perfection when you should just be asking for improvement. Right. Okay, so the next uh, couple fallacies we're going to look at are called the line drawing fallacy and the slippery slope fallacy. So the line drawing fallacy is a mistake um, in that it asks of certain types of vague concepts that they're not vague, that they be crystal clear, you know, sort of like when they're occurring, right? And um, I think that's the, that's the idea with a line drawing. Um, you're asking for a hard and fast line to be drawn for when a concept will occur, when the concept doesn't work like that, you know. 
Um, so a really good example uh, is, is something like this. So imagine I said to you, uh, you know, are you rich? And you said no, no as a response, right? So you, you admit that you aren't rich and I say, okay, well, I'm going to give you a dollar, right? And um, of course, if you're not rich, um, adding a dollar is not going to make you rich, right? So now you have this dollar and then I say to you, okay, well, you're not rich, so then I'm going to give you another dollar. And of course, the dollar is not going to change that again, right? It's not going to make you rich again. So now if you follow that type of reasoning, of course, if I gave you say five million dollars one at a time you still wouldn't be rich but of course you probably you know you probably would be so um, the point is is that the concept rich doesn't work like that there's no specific moment when someone becomes rich right it's not like uh, if you had a million dollars you'd be rich and if you had nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine uh, dollars or whatever then then uh, you wouldn't be rich you know you still would be so um, the, the idea is that the concept rich just doesn't, uh, it's not uh, definitive like that. It's not working on a fine line like that. And so we can't ask the concept to work like that when it's not, uh, you know, it's not something that does that. Um, another example is a concept like bald, right? Um, it's, it's not like with the concept bald, it's not like if you have say 500 hairs on your head that you're not bald. And if you have 499 you are right a uh, concept like bald doesn't work like that either you know it's clear that if you have no hair on your head you are bald and if you have a full head of hair uh, you, you know you're not right but when exactly someone becomes bald it, it's not really um, so clear right so the mistake with line drawing is, is asking of concepts like that that they are definitive and clear uh, when, when you're not really allowed to do that Okay, slippery slope. Um, you know, I think this one uh, is is it can be kind of a funny one. There's um, some advertisements on television where you see these kind of um, types of mistakes. Um, but a slippery slope is essentially suggesting that there's a causal relationship occurring when it, there's really no uh, reason to think that such a causal relationship exists. You know, and um, a classic example, uh, you know, that I hear uh, pro gun rights people say something like well look if we uh you know take away certain gun rights then all of them will be stripped away from us you know so for example if we required that handguns be registered all of a sudden before you know it nobody will be allowed to have a handgun anymore or any kind of gun at all right and of course there's no reason to think that just you know sort of requiring a handgun to be registered will lead to anything like that right um, another kind of hilarious uh, example is if you ever watch, um, <clears throat> there's a series of commercials, advertisements on television uh, for Direct TV, the cable service, and uh, these things are always kind of slippery slope, um, but it's kind of in a hilarious way. Like, you know, essentially the, the commercials, what they do is they portray someone who doesn't select Direct TV, and then they end up with this kind of hor horrific sequence of events that happens, right, as a result of not not uh, getting direct TV, you know? And so um, the suggestion is, of course, that you should get direct TV. But I, I think that's kind of a lighthearted, um, you know, look at, uh, you know, a slippery slope, but that's, that's definitely something you might want to have a look at if you, if you can. Uh, okay, so the next uh, fallacy and reasoning that we're gonna look at is called misplacing the burden of proof. And it is, I think, probably one of the most complex ones. And that to understand uh, this fallacy, you have to first understand what the burden of proof is, okay? Um, so to understand that, what we want to think about is the idea of an issue, okay? So an issue, if you remember back, I think it was to lecture two or something, um, we were discussing the nature of an issue. And an issue is a, it's just a, a, a question, a type of question that can be answered only in two ways, right? Yes or no. So say, for example, that we, we consider the um, issue of whether or not ghosts exist, or even better, um, whether or not Bigfoot exists. Think about that one, right? Does Bigfoot exist? You can answer yes, or you can answer no. And the idea is that those two answers to that issue, that question, are the two positions you could take on the issue. So you could believe, yes, Bigfoot is real, or no, Bigfoot is not, right? Now, the idea is that the burden of proof will rest on one of those two positions, 
right? It's either going to rest on the person that thinks that Bigfoot is real or the person that thinks that Bigfoot isn't real, right? And what we say is that, of course, um, the burden of proof rests upon the, the, the position that's the least plausible. That tends to be the, the general rule, right? Now, considering the two possible issues here, it's less plausible, right, that Bigfoot is actually real. So that's where the burden of proof rests. Now, to say the burden of proof rests there, where Bigfoot, uh, the belief that Bigfoot is real, is uh, what it means is that um, essentially there's a burden to prove that rests on the person believing that position. There's a burden to prove, right? Which uh, what it means, uh, I think, is that the person who holds that position where the burden of proof rests owes us argument, owes us a defense of that position, right? And so now if I'm sitting here and I hold the other position, the opposed position, right, that Bigfoot is not real, then from my perspective, I don't need to justify my position until the other person justifies theirs, until the, the, the position where the burden rests, until that position is defended, right? So the idea is uh, if, if, if somebody is defending the existence of Bigfoot, then for me, who doesn't believe in Bigfoot, I better get some really, really good reasons, some really good evidence before I would even consider trying to defend my position, right? Why should I have to defend my position when uh, the existence of Bigfoot is so implausible, right? So that's the idea with uh, the burden of proof. Now, usually, like I said, the burden of proof rests on the most implausible of the two positions, right? And so misplacing the burden of proof is a persuasive tool that's used to shift the burden without any reason. Right? So, for example, if uh, someone was uh, believing that, if someone believed that uh, Bigfoot was real, and they told me, and I, and I was the opponent there, and I said, look, I don't think Bigfoot's real at all. Tell me why. And that person's response is, well, you tell me why you don't think Bigfoot is real. Right? And essentially that question, what is it? it's doing is it's, try, it's essentially shifting the burden back to me, the person who doesn't think Bigfoot is real, without even a hint of argument or reason, right? And so that's the idea with the, the burden of proof shift, right, the misplacing, is that you're doing it persuasively to try to draw the argument away, the reason, the position, uh, and, and the defense back to the other side without really giving any reason for doing so, right? It's kind of like an unfair type of move, you know? Um, the, uh, the very last um, fallacy we're going to look at for this lecture is called begging the question. And uh, begging the question, the idea with begging the question is that it's kind of like it sounds, right? Um, when you beg the question, you are begging a question, right? Now, it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky fallacy, this one, because there's several different ways that this one goes. And there's actually a, a number of ways that we can sort of put this kind of mistake, okay? And that's the tricky nature of it. Um, I think in general, the, the mistake here with begging the question is that um, it's kind of this move where you make an argument and you are trying to support a conclusion, but there's really never any um, independent reason given for that conclusion, right? And so um, you're still left sort of wondering, really, uh, why should I believe this, you know? And uh, a lot of times what we see with begging the question is that um, it appears that an argument is being given, but the, um, the, what appears to be the premises or reasons for that conclusion are just kind of, uh, you know, the conclusion restated or the conclusion put in another way or uh, the, the premise or the reason given is, is actually just resting on uh, the conclusion for support, right? So um, consider, for example, um, if I was to argue that God exists because it says so in the Bible, but then uh, implied there, uh, you know, is the idea that the Bible is inspired by God, right? So my argument is essentially that God exists because God inspired the Bible and the Bible says that God exists. 
So if you think about really what I'm doing there is I'm arguing that God exists because God exists, right? And so uh, really I don't have any independent support for my uh, conclusion that God exists at all. It's just a restatement of, of the conclusion. And uh, so that type of move there, that's uh, begging the question. That's what we would call circular reasoning. So circular reasoning is a type of begging the question where um, the conclusion, uh, the, the proof for the conclusion, the, the reasons, the premises actually sort of indirectly or directly actually rest upon the conclusion um, themselves. So. <clears throat> uh, another way to think about um, how begging the question goes, I think, um, <clears throat> is again, um, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're left wondering where, where's the proof? Where's the reason? Where's the support, right? So imagine that I, um, I say uh, about abortion, right? I say, well, look, abortion is wrong because it's murder, right? And of course, if you think about the, the way I've defined abortion there as murder, right? That kind of definition implies, right, in the very uh, word or idea of murder, it implies uh, being immoral, being wrong, right? And so when I define abortion as murder, I'm just sort of indirectly um, d defining it as wrong at the same time. And so what I've done is just sort of beg that question. I've just assumed the truth that, uh, of, of the claim that uh, abortion is wrong without really showing any, giving any proof for that. So, all right. Um, I think uh, that'll do it then for today. That, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the uh, lecture. Again, um, I think the point here to take away is that uh, fallacies and reasoning are kind of like mistakes, but they tend to be um, like persuasive tools, right? They're bad reasoning, but, you know, with intent, right, to actually try to persuade and, and influence. So you just have to be, uh, you know, what we're, we're, we're learning here is that you just have to be a bit careful about um, the arguments you get because uh, we want to watch out for these types of mistaken ones, all right? All right, well, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.